This is the story of what I experienced in a strange town that I stopped in during my road trip. The small town where I stopped for gas and food was surrounded by dense forest. Strangely, there was no staff at the gas station, and the restaurant was empty with no one. But the store doors were open, and it seemed people were there since there were some leftovers on the tables in the restaurant. I wandered around the town, but it was strangely dark and cold as if the sun was not shining at all. Then I found dozens of people gathered in one restaurant. I went into that restaurant. The door was jingling open as I came in. However, no one looked at me, and they were just eating and exclaiming. Then one guy looked at me, eating something with his mouth full of yellow liquid. I was stunned for a moment. Then he said, It looks like you were from other towns. How did you know we eat healthy food here? Healthy food? I approached them, and all the people in the restaurant were eating something. Upon closer look, it... It was the corpse of a gigantic, monstrous creature that I had never seen before. It had yellow skin, two large snake-like heads, and limbs with a massive body over seven feet tall. I screamed, but people paid no attention and focused on eating like crazy. I asked the man what the hell it was, and he rolled up his forearm and showed it to me. Look at this. As he exerted his strength, the muscles swelled enormously. I was startled, and he suddenly grabbed me by the collar and lifted me to the ceiling. I screamed in shock. He just lifted me like a toy and threw me onto the floor. I was panicked and he laughed. I can feel my power that I can tear you to death with my bare hands. I have too much power. This meat gave me this much power. He held a piece of meat in his hand and showed it to me. There was a subtle light. Having this meat also makes me feel great. It's like taking medicine. Do you want to try this? How much money do you have? <laughs> I scanned the faces of the people one by one. Their eyes were all red and bloodshot, and the muscles all over their bodies were so swollen that their clothes were about to tear. I said I just wanted to use the gas station and the restaurant, but people told me, Food is just trash! If you want to be healthy, you should eat something like this. I felt too nervous and just went out of the restaurant. I decided to wait at the gas station. After a while, the gas station staff came back and said, do not ever tell anyone what you saw here. I asked why and he replied, This is rare because there are only a few of them. Only we can eat it. As he spoke, the muscles throughout his body cramped and he breathed heavily. I left the town in great confusion and it seemed I would never go there again. But a few years later, I stopped by the town while on another road trip. However, unlike the past visit, the village was completely empty. It looks no one was on the streets, and all the houses, shops, and restaurants looked long since ruined. I was shocked again, and I asked about the town when I arrived in another village dozens of miles from there. And I heard that the people in that town had all been attacked and killed by something unknown. Even more horrifying was that all their bodies were found only left with skin, empty of flesh, bones, and organs inside. However, the police said that they have never been able to identify what made them that way. The only evidence was the unknown yellow liquid buried all over the town in the footprints of an unknown giant beast. But it is also said that the origin of the footprints was unidentified, and it remains unsolved to this day. I was appalled. I wanted to talk about what I had seen, but my body shook severely, and I couldn't speak at all. What the hell happened in that town? I am a night person who likes to jog around my neighborhood at night. I did the same on this day around 13 years ago. I changed into my sweatshirt around 9 p.m. and went outside for a run. As I ran outside, I enjoyed taking the cool night air into my lungs. I suddenly heard footsteps from somewhere and turned toward where I thought the sound was coming from. I could see a man coming towards me, swinging his arms. He was Nicholas, one of my neighbors. He had one hand on his neck, and his white t-shirt was stained with blood. I was surprised and asked him what was going on, and he shouted, My blood! 
He then collapsed on the ground, bleeding from his neck. I slowly approached him with hesitancy and saw another man at the entrance of Nicholas's house. He was dancing behind the collapsed Nicholas. The man was wearing a weird costume like a red cape. He looked at me, brightly smiled, and yelled, He won't die because I haven't drunk too much. Then he laughed and rushed off into the darkness. I supported Nicholas and panicked because I had no idea what was happening. He was half fainted and said, That bastard sucked all my blood. He looked pale and weak. I called the police and the strange man in the red cape had already ran away by the time the police arrived. The officers left to track him down. Nicholas was later transferred to the hospital where they expected him to die from excessive bleeding. A few days later, his testimony to the police was released, and it was shocking. On the night of the incident, someone knocked on the door while he was alone at home. He opened the door, and a man said he was thirsty and asked for something to drink. When Nicholas tried to give him water, the man said, There are no nutrients in water. The ones I need are in your body. And forcibly climbed onto Nicholas's body pulling out an iron straw to suck blood from his neck. When the police heard Nicholas's testimony at first, they said it was an unbelievable claim. However, the police began tracking the culprits and several pieces of evidence were found in his home. Not long after the tracking, the police caught the culprit, a crazy man who claimed to be a vampire. His straw was made of iron and the tip was as sharp as a knife. He had assaulted people in the middle of the night, sneaking inside the alleyways, sucking their blood, and leaving. Then, he became bold enough to enter another person's house. He said that he thought Nicholas's blood would be very delicious as soon as he saw Nicholas's face, and he was right. He also told the police that he should choose his object carefully since each human has a different taste in blood and selecting the wrong person with unfavorable blood does not quench his thirst at all. He then reportedly smiled at the police officer and said, Mr. Policeman, your blood must be salty and sour. Let me suck your blood a sip and I'll tell you my secret. The police got angry with him and the man proudly said that he had sucked the blood of more than 50 people. The man eventually ended up in prison and Nicholas suffered severe trauma for some time. He lived in his house plastered with crosses and moved to another city altogether at the end. However, 10 years later, a rumor began that a vampire had again assaulted the village. As I thought of it, I wondered if the crazy man had just been released from prison. One day, while jogging at night, I heard something fluttering behind me and I looked back. There was a man and he had a cape on, flapping in the wind and running like crazy toward me. I was so startled that I fell to the ground and he pulled out a very large, long iron straw and tried to climb on top of me. I felt the fear of death, kicked him hard and he groaned and fell to the ground. And he said to me as he pointed the sharp straw right at me, I've always wondered what your blood tastes like. He stabbed a straw in my arm and my blood gushed out. He then put his mouth on my arm to suck the blood. I punched him in his face, but he kept sucking my blood even though he got hit. I instantly felt drained as the blood left from my body, and I was terrified. I kept punching him in the face until he fell backward in pain. I ran away as fast as I could, and he shouted at me from behind. Your blood tastes like peanut butter! I'll come back to suck your blood again next time! <laughs> I ran away from him and called the police. He was arrested and put in jail again. That seems to be the end of my horrific nightmare, but every night I am terrified that he will appear again one day, and I still have the scar from his straw on my arm. This happened to me two years ago, in the summer. I was 14 back then. I lived in a small town in Estonia. I have a best friend, let's call him Stan. Stan lived right next door. Stan and I really loved exploring in the forest. We would often find some really cool places. One day, we decided to visit an old mansion that was located in the middle of the woods, and behind it was a big beautiful lake. 
The mansion was a few miles from our apartments. We started walking there, and while walking, we joked about the manor, how we would see ghosts and abnormal things. When we arrived at the manor, it gave really bad vibes. My friend noticed it and told me that it felt very creepy and that we should go. I told him not to be such a pussycat and we went inside. Biggest mistake of my life. The mansion did not have stairs, so we had to climb up through the window. When we were inside, I don't know what happened, but I got chills, like someone was watching us. We went to the second floor. It was all covered in rocks. My friend started to slowly lose it. He wanted to leave so badly. I told him, Wait, wait. We haven't finished going to the attic. That's where the problem started. When we arrived in the attic, we began to explore it. Then suddenly, my friend screamed. I flinched and asked him what was going on, but I could barely finish my sentence when I saw a woman hanging from her wrists. She had white foam around her mouth and bruises around her body. We ran downstairs like maniacs, climbed out and ran towards the town. When I was running, I saw what looked like a doll sitting on a tree branch. When I looked away, it was gone. We called the police and I told them about the woman and the doll. They went in the manor and they found the woman with the doll right next to it. Later the police told us that the woman was poisoned with strychnine. Then I looked up in Google about its history. The manor belonged to a very rich family in the 1900s and the mansion was abandoned because the wife was a serial killer who poisoned at first her whole family and then all of her relatives. And guess what she always left behind? A doll. My mom once told me about her mother's childhood scary story. When my grandma was a child, her family moved to a new house. The house my grandma moved to was a long-legged home, and there was always water under the house. If you wanted to go to a neighbor's house, you had to go by boat. My grandma's family was all Buddhists, so they cooked dishes at night, and in the morning, they donated the dishes to monks, as is tradition. But strange things began to happen in that house. Dishes were disappearing every day, as if someone had stolen them. At first, it was thought that a family member had eaten them, but the dishes were prepared for three or four people, and more than a single serving. One person couldn't eat all that food. After months of such strange things, the water under their long-legged house began to recede, and they came down to clean there. Then, my grandma saw a horrible thing. It exposed something creepy. It was a dead body wrapped around one of the house's long legs, and it was already decomposed. My grandma's family realized that the person who stole all the dishes was the dead body. My mom told me that the dead body must have been killed by something or someone and then left in the river. We then watched as the water flowed back in and the body was taken out with the current and floated down the river. Hi, I wanted to share this story with you that happened to me about 10 years ago. I grew up on a big farm in Sweden. We had a ton of different animals, ranging from dogs, cats, horses, and sheep. I was around 16 or 17, and it was in the middle of winter. I was in charge of feeding the animals before bedtime, since my foster parents had to get up early for work. I wasn't afraid of the dark, but I didn't enjoy it either. I always took the dogs with me and asked the oldest to be close to me for safety. She was a very protective dog. I was walking down from the house and right in front of me was two big pastures. At the time, they were empty, or at least they should have been, since they are only used in the summer. But in the second pasture, in the middle, I saw a shadow just standing. It looked like a human, but way too tall. It was as tall as the windshed, so around 10 feet tall. I just stood there and stared, not really knowing what I should do. Then Doris, the dog, 
started to bark and ran down to the pasture. You have to go around a stable and a barn to get to that pasture. And since it was dark outside, she quickly disappeared in the darkness. I started to run after her and shouted her name to come back. I remember glancing at the thing right before the stable blocked my view. When I rounded the barn, I saw Dora staring at the spot where it should be standing, but it was nowhere to be found. Not even tracks in the snow. I have no idea what I saw that night, but even now, as an adult, I refuse to go out alone when it's dark. And I'm sure that I didn't imagine it because of Doris. She never barked and ran towards anything unless she had a reason. Hi, my name is Charlotte and I'm 20 years old. I had a weird experience a week ago. The day started like a normal day. I worked in the morning till 8 p.m. When I got home from work, I noticed that my roommate was acting strange. Let's call him Alex. I asked him if there was something wrong, but he didn't answer me and walked upstairs without saying a word. If you know Alex, he normally is a kind-hearted person and also a very talkative person. So it was weird that he was acting weird like this randomly. I thought maybe he just had a bad day. When I walked upstairs, I opened the door to my bedroom, but before I entered my room, I saw Alex standing at the end of the hallway. I said, hey Alex, I just got home, I hope you're doing okay. When I said that, he stared at me with a weird look on his face. It kind of freaked me out, so I just said, well, good night. I'm going to bed soon because I have to go to work early tomorrow. Sleep well. As I said that, he didn't say anything, like I was talking to a wall. I got a bit angry because normally he never ignores me. Anyway, when I got into my room, I changed into my PJs and got into bed. I was really tired from that day, so I fell asleep fast. Then around four in the morning, I heard footsteps in the hallway. I thought that Alex probably needed to use the bathroom, but he wasn't walking to the bathroom. He was walking in the hallway from left to right. This was weird, but I didn't think much of it. Around five minutes later, I needed to use the toilet to do my business. When I got out of bed and opened my bedroom door, he was standing right in front of me. This scared me to death. I got angry at him for scaring me like that. Again, he didn't say anything. I was pissed and walked downstairs to the toilet. When I was done, I didn't hear any footsteps anymore. Finally, he went to bed, I thought. When I got upstairs, he wasn't walking in the hallway anymore. I got to bed and was relieved he finally went to bed. The next morning, I woke up at 6 to get ready for work. I changed into my work clothes and wanted to go downstairs and eat something. When I got downstairs, I saw Alex making eggs. Good morning, Charlotte, he said. He was the complete opposite of how he acted yesterday. Good morning, I said back. I asked him how he was doing. I'm doing very well, he answered. I asked him why he acted so weird and strange yesterday, and he looked at me as if he didn't know what I was talking about. Um, you do remember that I was out with my friends all day, right? He asked. My mouth fell open when he said that. But then who was in my house yesterday? He gave me a frightened look on his face and asked what happened, so I told him the whole story. He called the police right after I finished telling my story. When they arrived, they checked the whole house, but nothing and no one was found, sadly. To this day, I have no idea who that person was that I talked to, but it gives me shivers down my spine when I think about it. Hi, I'm Danny. I was sleeping in my spare bedroom because as a six-year-old girl, I hated sleeping in my room because it was on the other side of the house from my parents' room. So the bed I slept in was on the wall opposite of where the door was so I could see the door and if it was cracked open, the shadow would go on a wall so I could easily see what was going on outside of my room by the shadow. One day I slept in and I saw a shadow on the wall sorting mail because there was a dining table on the other side of the door. I yelled, mom. I heard no answer, so I yelled again, Mom! Still no answer. It really scared me because I knew she would answer. Believe me, she would answer. So I just laid there watching the shadow on the wall sorting mail. Another thing is that we normally don't have a lot of mail, but the shadow just kept sorting mail. Next thing I knew, it was gone, so I slowly got up and looked on the other side of the door. Nothing was there, so I walked to my mom's room and she was passed out asleep. That scared the crap 
out of little six-year-old me, and later that day I asked her if she was sorting mail and she had no idea what I was talking about. Today, the only person I've told this to is my friend Kate. This happened a while ago when I was home alone. It wasn't my first time being home alone, but what happened will terrify me if I'm ever home alone again. My parents had to go see my sick grandma, and she lived on the other side of the country, so it took at least five hours to get there. I wanted to go too, but I had an important exam the next day, so I stayed back. I don't have any siblings, so I had the house all to myself. My parents left at six in the evening. After they'd left, I just went to my room and started playing some video games. An hour or so went by, and I had to study or I wasn't going to pass the exam the next day, so I took out my notes and started going through them. I was listening to some music, so I almost couldn't hear anything. After a while, I started to get a little hungry, so I went to grab some snacks from the kitchen upstairs since my room is in the basement. I was rummaging through the fridge when I heard a knock at the door. It was kind of odd since my parents had told me we weren't expecting anyone. Quietly, I went to take a peek through the peephole. It was a girl. She looked to be around 14 or 15, and she was holding someone's hand, who I assumed was her little sister. I was so busy taking in their appearance that I didn't notice she was still knocking. Now, even louder. I asked her who she was and what she wanted without opening the door. There was no answer. Instead, she started knocking even harder. Then I heard a bang. This time, it seemed to be coming from my parents' room. I was scared at this point. I threw the pack of chips I was holding and rushed downstairs to my room and locked it. I started hearing someone's footsteps coming towards the basement. I hid under my bed, waiting for what was about to happen next. I almost started crying when I remembered that I'd left my phone on the kitchen table. Suddenly, I could hear police sirens, but I was confused because I didn't get the chance to call the police. It turned out that my parents' room faced our neighbor's house. When she heard the bangs, she knew something was wrong, so she peeped through her blinds only to see a sketchy person was trying to break into our house through my parents' bedroom window. She immediately called 911. The knocking on our door was a trap to distract me, so the burglars could get into our house. The burglars tried to run, but were soon caught. My parents were later called. I'm forever thankful to my neighbor for saving my life. Hi, I'm a 16-year-old girl from Finland. I have one creepy experience that I want to share. I really don't believe in paranormal activity, but this made me think twice. When I was seven years old, we moved into a new house that was built in the 1950s. The house was pretty huge and had three floors. Back then, I had just one little sister. She was about two at the time. One day, my parents and my sister were just chilling at home. I wasn't in there because I was with my friends. That day, something strange happened with my sister. My mom asked her what's wrong, and my sister just pointed her finger at the stairwell and said, that girl isn't my big sister. My mother thought it was just a child's imagination and shrugged it off. But my sister kept saying other things like, there's a little girl, who's that girl? And she pointed her finger to the empty stairs. This made my parents a little uncomfortable. A few weeks later, our family friends came to visit us. They had a three-year-old kid. Let's call her Hannah. Hannah sat around our kitchen table. The table has a straight eye line to the stairwell. She stared at the stairs and said, why is there a flattened girl? My parents and Hannah's parents saw no one there. We always keep the lights on the stairs if someone needs to go to the bathroom or something at night. Sometimes we heard footsteps from the stairs, but weren't scared by that, we were just confused. When I was 13 years old, I was up late at night. Everyone was already asleep, but I wanted to watch YouTube and stay up. Suddenly, stair lights went on and off very fast for a whole minute. I was a little scared, but I still didn't pay much attention. My other baby sister, Susan, was born in 2018. The last part of this paranormal experience happened in 2019, when my younger sister, Susan, was a year old. My parents and Susan were in the living room. Susan said to my parents, why is there a girl on the ceiling? And sometimes she asked about a girl who was on the stairs and in the living room. So that was my paranormal experience. Me and my parents have no clue what my sisters and Hannah saw when they were little children. 
These days, they don't remember anything about the stairwell ghost girl. I wonder if a little girl died at our house in the past. Even today, I hear footsteps on the stairs, but I'm not scared. I hope someday the girl ghost gets where she belongs. My name is Nathan Mendez. I am from Houston, Texas, and this is a very sad story that I am about to share. As a little kid, when I first heard the song What I've Done by Linkin Park, it was in the end credits of Transformers 1 from 2007. Thanks to Transformers, I became a Linkin Park fan even though Chester Bennington died, or so I thought. Fast forward to 2022. On April 10th, I went to the Houston Galleria Mall. The Houston Galleria Mall is one of the biggest shopping malls in Houston, Texas. My family and I were looking for formal clothes to wear for church on Easter Sunday. When my mother was in a store called Bed Bath & Beyond, I waited outside. A few minutes went by and a man approached me who looked and sounded exactly like Chester Bennington. He asked me if I knew where GameStop was because he had a son whose birthday had passed the month before. I pointed him in the right direction, but before I let him go about his business, I asked the man, what is your son's name? He answered Tyler. I asked him another question. Are you Chester Bennington of Lincoln Park? But he didn't answer that question. He just turned and ran away. I even thought to myself, that can't be Chester Bennington because he died on July 20th of 2017. I just need to know something. Was that actually Chester Bennington? Or was that his ghost? Hello, I'm a 17-year-old girl who is attending high school in Japan. Before I start, it's important to note that I'm a timid person, so I'm not good at anger and I'm not good at rejecting. Because of this, people often tell me that I'm nice. My friends know that I'm like this and often have to step in and help me. The story began earlier in the year, but we'll get to that. For now, let me tell you about a day that I will never forget. The day that showed me what happens when you're too nice. It was summer break. I will often go to a local pool with my friends during the summer, and this day was no different. It was supposed to rain all day, so I thought my friends wouldn't be interested in going and that our visit was canceled. However, I got a call from one of my friends. She asked me to go to the pool even though it was a rainy day. I said to her, Are you sure that's a good idea? She made the argument that the weather would make sure that the pool wasn't as crowded. Even better, if we went in the evening, there would probably be no one there, and we would have the entire pool to ourselves. I liked the idea and decided to go to the swimming pool with her in the evening. We walked together to the pool in the rain. When we got there, it was just as she thought. No one was there. She and I swam and splashed in the pool. We were having so much fun playing in the water. At one point, as we floated on the surface of the water, we got to talking about relationships. As soon as this topic came up, I tried to change the subject. You see, before summer break, a boy from school had confessed to me that he liked me and asked me to be his girlfriend. He was pretty average looking, but I just didn't know him that well and wasn't interested in a relationship. Not knowing how to properly explain this to him without hurting his feelings, I instead decided to lie to him. I foolishly told him that I already had a boyfriend and left him standing there. Of course, she knew this and decided to tease me about what my fake boyfriend was doing while we were at the pool. I laughed a little and then decided to get revenge for making things awkward. I snuck up on her and dumped her into the water for a second. She jokingly scolded me and we laughed together about how silly the whole situation was. We went back to treading water and talking about random teenager stuff. That was until I felt someone was staring at me from somewhere behind me. I looked back, but there was no one there. My friend noticed my look of worry and asked me what was wrong. I brushed it off since I didn't see anyone and I reassured her it was nothing. Maybe it was her reminding me of the guilt I felt lying to that guy from school. We went back to playing in the water after I reassured her things were fine. As we continued splashing around, I felt it again. Someone was watching me. I turned again to look. I saw nothing, but I had had it. I decided to make up an excuse as to why we should leave. She seemed a little unsure about what I said, but she didn't question it, and we got out of the pool. My friend and I went to the showers together. I love the feeling of warm water and the relaxing process of getting cleaned up in the shower. 
so I usually take longer than my friends. Because of this, my friend finished first and headed out of the showers and into the locker rooms to start getting dressed. As I was rinsing my hair, I heard footsteps from somewhere. At first, I thought it must be my friend, so I didn't care and continued to wash up. But the sound of footsteps got closer and closer until I heard them stop directly behind me. I was in the process of rinsing my face off under the water, so I turned quickly to see who was behind me. I can still, to this day, clearly picture what I saw when I turned around. There, standing just one step away from me, was the boy who confessed to me. I was so startled and scared that I froze on the spot and didn't even scream. I wondered if screaming would lead to him hurting me. Suddenly, he reached out and grabbed my arms. That was when I screamed and tried to pull away from him, tears running down my face. We struggled against each other for a bit. He was staring directly into my eyes with an eerie and wide-eyed expression. I was able to maneuver myself in a way that allowed me to kick him in the stomach, which caused him to fall to the floor with a thud. I hurriedly got out of the shower room, grabbed a towel, wrapped it around myself, and ran to my friend. She had already finished getting dressed, and her phone was in her hand. As soon as she saw me, she asked me what happened to me, and I told her. She quickly grabbed me and pulled me into a nearby bathroom stall. We locked the door, and she called the police. When the police arrived, they searched the shower room. They found him in the same place I knocked him down. Apparently, when I knocked him down, he hit his head and was unconscious. They arrested him that day. The events of that day have scarred me for life. It's made me wary of going to the pool, but most of all, it's made me realize that sometimes lying to be nice can be deadly. <laughs> my name is Rui, and I am from India. I live with my parents and older brother. One evening, my parents went outside to shop. Since I was grown up and was not afraid of staying home alone, I convinced my brother to go for a walk. Finally, after he agreed, I locked the door from inside. After a while, while I was studying, I heard a bang. Now, the twist is that I live in an apartment, so either it was a break-in or something happening next door. I peeked outside my door and my heart sank. A bearded man with an iron rod had broken my door and was trying to get inside through the gap. I thought quickly. I had been watching C Entertainment and I knew what to do. I could have chosen my brother's room as it had the best lock, but I chose to stay in my room as it had some weapons. Since the man had managed to get in, I immediately locked the door, dialed the police and grabbed a hammer, pocket knife, and compass. The police told me to hide in the room until they arrived. I didn't hide in the wardrobe because it was full of clothes. And if the man found me, there I wouldn't be able to attack him. Then I called the security office man for the apartment, but he didn't answer the phone. My first thought was that he had been killed by this maniac. Now the maniac was laughing and banging on the door. I knew the door would break soon if he used the iron rod, and his laugh didn't sound like a person. <laughs> then the lock broke. Right as he was coming inside, I didn't even give him a moment and stabbed him with the compass and smashed the hammer over his head. He fell down, crying in pain. Then I used my karate training to knock him out so that I didn't accidentally kill him with the weapons. Then I heard the police sirens. They entered my house and handcuffed him. Surprisingly, after they removed his fake beard, I saw a boy my age, whom I had slapped a few days ago because he had teased me in public. He screamed, I'm going to get you. I later learned that the security guard was not dead. He was actually just scared because the intruder had an iron rod and let him in. That was also why he didn't pick up the phone. He was fired on the spot for not calling the police and the boy got eight years in prison. He had known that no one was at home except for me and had planned 
to kidnap me. I still think what would have happened if I hadn't kept some weapons ready. This story happened in 2010, when I was 11 years old. I was visiting my family from Poland, because at the time I lived in Norway. I was very excited to meet them again, since we hadn't been in Poland for a few years. When we got there, we were greeted at the door by our family. In case you're wondering, our family lives in a usual Polish apartment. When we got inside, we got to say hello to all the family that was there, including my favorite cousin. She was 13 at the time. We talked a lot in her room while my parents ate with the others. I told her I wanted to go to the playground near the apartment and stay there for a while, cause I get bored just sitting and talking. We asked our parents for permission, and they said yes, but not to be there for too long, probably cause it was about 8pm and would get dark soon. We agreed and went down to the playground. When we got there it was very cold at the time because it was winter. We played there for about 20 minutes before we decided to go back to the house. Just as we were about to go back inside, I saw something hiding behind some trees. I told my cousin, and she saw it too. We stood there and just watched this thing staring at us. After about 10 seconds, the thing noticed that we were staring at it, and it came creeping closer to us. It moved very slowly towards us. Both of us were terrified and trembling. And then we saw what was the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. It was a man with bloodshot eyes, and his right arm was gone. He looked at us without blinking, and then he flashed us the creepiest smile we had ever seen. My cousin and I just stood there, thinking that the man was probably going to hurt us. My cousin and I were frozen in fear. Suddenly the man started moving, and just walked away. We immediately ran into our grandparents' apartment, and as we got there, we calmed down, knowing we were safe. We never told anybody about this afterwards. I'm 23 years old now, and this story is still stuck in my memory. My name is Vanessa, and I live in the UK. I'm the oldest out of four children within my home, and this story is mainly about my youngest brother, who was a baby at the time. One day after school, me, my younger sister, and my baby brother were in my room waiting for our parents to come home from work. Me and my sister sat on my bed watching YouTube videos together, and my baby brother was on the floor, playing and crawling around. This was the usual, as it would only be an hour or two before one of our parents came back. As I mentioned before, my baby brother was on the bedroom floor crawling, and the walk-in closet door was open. Now looking back, this was very odd, as the door would always be closed, as there wasn't anything interesting in there, just boxes of old stuff that my mom didn't want to throw away. Because the door was open, my baby brother would go in it and play with the boxes, and we could tell it was him as he would always giggle doing so. Me and my little sister must have gotten distracted watching the videos, because when I went to check on my brother, the door was closed. I thought this was weird, as you can't close the door, as there is no handle from the inside, but I heard the boxes moving, so I thought maybe my baby brother found a way inside. I opened the closet door to get him out of there, so I could watch him. He came out and started playing again, and I closed the closet door behind him. I got back to watching the videos with my sister, and after a while we heard the boxes moving again, except this time with no giggles. Me and my sister looked at each other confused as I just let my baby brother out. I stared at the door for a while and wondered how was this happening until the door suddenly started rattling, rattling like something was trying to get out. I paid no mind as I thought it was my brother again, although I had my doubts. When the door kept rattling, my other brother Jonathan, who was 12 at the time, came home and came to my room looking for something. I asked him with my back turned to him to open the closet to let my brother out. He said to me in a confused voice, what do you mean, and Aldo is right behind me. My sister and I looked at each other in shock, and we saw my baby brother crawling behind Jonathan. Me and my sister ran out of the room screaming and told our mother when she came home. She didn't believe us for some reason, but let's just say that I haven't opened that closet door since, and it's now barricaded with a TV stand. Weird things kept happening in our home after that. Random knocking on doors and walls, dark shadows and weird appearances in mirrors. 
It's been three years since then, and I still wonder what was in my closet. This happened to me three years ago, but to this day, I still get chills when I think about this experience. I was 14 years old at the time, and my mom, my sister, and I had recently moved into an old house. It was very big, and the previous owner was an old woman who had died a while ago. A lot of time had passed, and we really enjoyed living in this old house since we'd renovated a lot of things, and it looked quite good now. But there was one night that I will always remember. It was my friend's birthday party, and while it wasn't really late, I was so tired that I came home and fell asleep right away. I woke up about 3 a.m. and realized that I hadn't even taken off my shoes. So I started getting ready for bed. I went to the bathroom, brushed my teeth, and removed my makeup. Then I got back to my room, and as I was putting on my pajamas, I spotted something out of the corner of my eye standing across the street. I looked out the window of my room on the second floor, and I saw an old lady standing there, next to a tree. She was staring at me and wearing a dirty white dress. She had frizzy gray hair, light pale skin, red bloodshot eyes, and her mouth was open. She was missing some teeth, and I could smell her rotten breath even though I was far away. She also was very skinny. I stood there in shock and couldn't move. All I could do was look at her. She looked at me with her red eyes wide open, like a psycho. She didn't move either. Only her mouth twitched, and she made a weird mumbling sound. I immediately got goosebumps all over my body. She was just staring. And after what felt like an eternity, I started panicking and crying in hope that my mom would wake up. She came downstairs and asked what was wrong. I told her that there was a lady staring at me from across the street and that I was very scared of her. So my mom came into the room and looked out the window. As she was looking, I could still see the woman standing there, smiling <laughs> creepily at my mom and me. And what happened next shocked me to this day. My mom looked confusedly at me and said, Honey, what are you talking about? There's no one there. I looked at her in fear. What? Was I crazy? My mom had to sleep in my room that night because I was so traumatized and I didn't know what was wrong with me. But it didn't end there. The next day, we needed to get something to eat. And as we were sitting in the car near to where the woman had been standing, I started feeling weird. And I noticed the nasty smell of her breath in my nose. It made me feel sick to my stomach. And I started crying because I hadn't gotten over the previous night. After that, I started waking up in the middle of the night because I heard heavy breathing right next to me. That happened about five times. Then it just stopped. Since then, I've always looked out of my window every night before I go to sleep. Thankfully, I never saw her again. But I wonder, why could I smell her breath and hear her mumbling when she was standing across the street and my window was closed? Later, I found out that the previous owner died in my room. I don't know if that woman wanted to scare me because she wanted me out of her house or if it was just my mind playing tricks on me. But that night still haunts me to this day. It was a cold, rainy afternoon in Valencia City, Philippines back in 2011 when I was sleeping in my bed with a high fever due to catching the flu. My mom was sleeping next to me in bed because she was taking care of me and made sure I took my meds on time. As I was snuggling in my sheets, I slowly hear someone whispering in my ear from a distance. I opened my eyes with my heart beating so fast and I was trying to move my body, but to no avail, I could not. The whispers continued to echo from a distance and I couldn't actually recognize the sound I was hearing like it was all just a bunch of random words. Just then, the whispers came even closer to my ears, and I was panicking so bad, thinking, what is going on? Why can't I move? Why do I feel like there's someone standing at my feet? I got a very weird tingly sensation run down my spine, when I finally felt like something was actually whispering with its mouth an inch closer to my ear. I then remembered when I read about sleep paralysis on the internet and how to break free from it by trying to move your toes, and I did it. 
I was praying and trying to move my toes at the same time, hoping that I could break free from this nightmare. Luckily, I got out of it gasping some air and immediately woke up my mom and told her everything that happened. She got all worried and reassured me that everything's going to be fine because she won't leave me. I felt relieved and went back to sleep. One month had passed and I was watching some comedy movies in my room and it was around 11 p.m. when I suddenly felt the urge to drink some water. The outside of my room is a second living room and I need to head downstairs to grab a glass of cold water because that's where the fridge is located. As I got out of the room, I didn't bother to turn the lights on because the dim lights were turned on already and it was enough for me to see. As I was about to step out of the room, I noticed something in front of me sitting on the couch. It was all dark and only its eyes were gleaming despite the dim situation of the living room. The eyes were looking straight at me and I froze for what felt like an eternity. I finally managed to take a step back at my room and shut the door. I forgot to mention that both my mom and dad were with me in my room watching the movies as well. And they both stood up from their seats in shock because of the horror and emotion that I displayed on my face. I eventually moved on from that situation and forgot about it. Year 2016, when I graduated from college and went to Cebu City for my review and preparation for the upcoming board examination that year in November. I was living with a bunch of friends and classmates in a pretty decent house that we rented for the time being while we were having our review. It was all fun until one afternoon while I was sleeping, there was this familiar sensation that I felt that made my eyes to open widely. The same dark figure was standing right at the corner of the room. Only that time I could see it clearly and it was trying to reach me with its long, pointy hands. Again, I couldn't make myself move. I closed my eyes and kept them shut for five minutes and prayed to God for that hellish creature to be gone. Thankfully, I got out of it again. I still get some occasional sleep paralysis at times when I sleep in the afternoon. I am still scared even up to this day, but I somehow got used to it. All I can say is, even if you're scared to face your demons, you just have to stay tough and keep praying. God is always in control. My name is Brianna, and this happened to me a few years ago. I live in Silver City, New Mexico, and I was in a bad place at the time. I was living in a trailer park during that period, and I was about to walk to see my boyfriend. It was late. I'm not sure what time it was, but it was between 12 and 3 a.m. I got out of the house, turned on my phone flashlight, and began walking. Keep in mind that there is one large orange street light that illuminates the mailboxes near where you would turn to drive into the trailer park. However, as you walk down the road, there were no other lights, not even a single house light. I've always been a bit paranoid, but it was only a 10 to 20 minute walk, so what's the big deal? So I began walking down the street and my flashlight barely lit anything. I could see a few houses, but as I walked further down the road, I saw a massive ditch filled with trees, grass, weeds, shrubs, bushes, and a rail going down. On the right side of where I was walking, there was nothing but dirt and hills. I kept looking back as I walked to reassure myself that there was no need to be so worried and afraid, but I was just so nervous. I could see the end of the street from where I was standing. There was a dance studio on the left and a large fenced-in house on the right, almost like a checkpoint. It was a little far away, but I figured if I kept my flashlight straight and walked quickly, I'd be there in no time. Suddenly, I heard these movements, almost like steps. However, they weren't mine. I stopped and pointed my flashlight at the rail ditch, hoping to see someone walking or even an animal pass by but there was no one there. Hello, I yelled, shining my flashlight towards this big eerie tree that slumped over the rail, and nothing. I turned around to see if there was someone behind me, but there wasn't anyone. I thought I was just freaking myself out, so I kept walking. Then I heard a hissing noise coming from the hills, almost like a cat or a large animal. I pointed my flashlight to my right, and there, it was. I stopped in my tracks, my heart in my throat. It wasn't an animal. This thing had skin, clear skin, and I could see its spine. 
I didn't get a good look at its face, but it had an unusually long arms and legs. It was on its arms and legs and charged right at me. I had no choice but to book it down the street without looking back. I remember dropping a couple of items from one of my jacket pockets or pants pockets, but I didn't go back. I could hear its heavy and harsh breath getting closer and closer. I didn't have time to scream or cry or even get a better look at this thing. Finally, I made it to the light pole next to the fenced house. I looked back as soon as I got under the light pole and the creature was gone. I stood there for a moment, wondering if I was just paranoid and my imagination got the better of me, or if I had actually seen some demonic, ugly, skinwalker thing. I had no idea, but all I knew was that I needed to get the hell out of there. I ran down the street until I reached my ex-boyfriend. I'd never felt more at ease with his arms wrapped around me, just cuddling me and holding me tight. I never ended up telling him what I saw until a couple of years later. To this day, I still don't know if it was my mind playing tricks on me or if what I saw was actually a bloodthirsty creature preying on its next victim. I never returned to that trailer park or the road leading to it, and I hope I never have to. It was December 31st, my birthday. Since my birthday and New Year's coincided, my family decided to make it into one big event. So my parents invited all our family members over. We celebrated at my aunt's house as she was abroad at the time. The house was actually unoccupied most of the year. She hired a person to live there and take care of it. It was big, almost like a mansion, except there wasn't a second floor. It was just very spacious. My family members say the house is haunted, that spirits roam the halls when no one's around. Not to brag, but I was a smart kid. I genuinely didn't believe in ghosts. But that night changed everything. It was 10 seconds before midnight. My whole family shouted the countdown while I jumped up and ran around the room, waving my arms like an excited little kid. Five, four, three, two, one. New Year's noisemakers sounded, and some of my relatives bashed pans together in jubilation. I could hear cars and motorcycles honking outside as well. We ate after that, chatting amongst ourselves. I, however, was feeling sleepy, and I needed to pee. Putting my drink down on the table, I walked past my cousin, who was playing with my iPad and taking selfies. The hall leading to the bathroom was very short. You could easily get there in five seconds. The door to the bathroom was ornate and heavy. It always made a sound when I closed it, since I wasn't strong enough to close it softly. I felt around the wall to turn on the light switch, and I don't know if it was the lack of sleep or my imagination, but I saw a lady with her back toward me. She had long, black hair that went down to her lower back, and she wore a plain, white dress. She was so pale that she was glowing under the light. In disbelief and utter denial, I wiped my eyes with my free hand and blinked a few times, but she didn't disappear. She was still there, her back facing me. I gently pulled the door closer to me, so close that if I pulled it any closer, it would shut. Taking a deep breath, I opened it again. The lady was still there. She slowly turned her head, and I immediately closed the door and ran towards my family who were chatting idly and drinking wine. I sat back down on the sofa, and despite the cold weather, I was sweating. I managed to calm myself down after a few minutes. Suddenly, my cousin screamed, and everyone turned their attention to him. He pointed at my iPad. He looked scared, shocked, and in disbelief. My heart stopped when I saw what he'd caught in his selfies. The same lady black hair, white dress, pale skin, making her way to the bathroom. I knew he hadn't edited them, since there wasn't any editing software installed on it except for the included stuff, which was mediocre at best. Not to mention he can't edit to save his life. In almost every picture he'd taken, she was there, walking. He deleted the pictures, and I remember that I still needed to pee. I didn't want to go back to the bathroom alone. So I asked my mom to come with me. 
She was annoyed that I made her open the bathroom door and made her stand next to me while I peed. It still doesn't make sense. If what I saw that day was just my sleep-deprived mind imagining things, then what did my iPad catch that day? Needless to say, I believe in ghosts now. I never believed in the supernatural. I wanted to, but never felt afraid of it. Years spent scaring friends and watching horror movies that even my parents refused to watch. And each time I felt nothing. Not scared, just excited. If you were to ask any of my friends, they would tell you that I was the most fearless person they knew. I would make jokes about how I could summon the devil himself and he would be afraid of me. However, that all changed pretty quickly. My teacher had just reminded our class that there was a school excursion coming up. This was a Friday afternoon. That particular week, I became very interested in communicating with the dead and demon summoning rituals. This reminder from my teacher made me think of a clever prank I could play on my friends in order to scare them. I decided to purchase a Ouija board. I made a plan to bring it to the hotel we were all staying at in order to scare them, or at the very least, annoy them. I ended up ordering one right there, in class, before we left for the day. I found one pretty quickly, actually an old wooden Ouija board for no more than 15 pounds. I told my friends and laughed at their reactions. Most of them were creeped out and got annoyed, but in a funny sort of way. They started joking around saying how they would throw me out of the hotel with the Ouija board if I actually did bring one. However, one of my friends looked horrified as they told me just how bad of an idea it was. I told him that I didn't actually believe in ghosts and that this wouldn't actually work. Even if it did, I couldn't care less. I'm fearless, right? Luckily, the Ouija board would arrive in the mail on Saturday. I wasn't concerned about my parents saying anything about the Ouija board. They also don't believe in this stuff and will just label it as a useless wooden board. I was so excited when I woke up on Saturday and the Ouija board had already come in the mail. I hugged it close, excited for all the fun I was going to have messing with my friends on our trip, and ran to the kitchen. I sat at the table and I opened it carefully. Inside was the slightly old wooden board with its metal pointer, and to my surprise, there was a strange instruction guide full of text. I have two younger sisters, and just then they both walked through the kitchen. I had told them the night before about my plans for the Ouija board and that it would arrive that day. They both weren't too fond of the Ouija board being in the house and thought my idea was going too far, especially the youngest. She made sure to let me know that she wouldn't even touch the thing. They glanced over at me to see what I was doing and, once they saw the board, their faces turned to fright and they ran out of the room. As I read through the instructions, I had a strange feeling. Something didn't feel quite right. It creeped me out just a bit. There were so many rules. So many warnings and dangers filled the pages. I shook off the feeling of unease. At the time, I didn't realize just how important those rules were. Immediately after reading through the guide, I decided to play with the board. When beginning the session, I did all that I was supposed to. I followed all the rules written in the guide and stayed polite and calm when asking the spirits questions. But no matter how much I tried, nothing happened. I would try, wait, and then get nothing. Again and again, and still no response. Eventually, I got bored and ended it by saying goodbye. I left the board on the counter and continued on with my day. That evening, my mom and my two siblings went to the cinema leaving me home alone. I didn't care. Being alone wasn't a big deal because I wasn't scared of anything. In fact, staying at home alone was one of my favorite things at the time. I was sitting in the living room just scrolling on my phone. That was until I heard a loud crash and bang. It made me jump. Did that come from the kitchen? I went to check what had happened. I was cautious and all, but still not scared. I assumed something had fallen on the floor. I looked in the kitchen to see what had fallen over. That's when it happened. We had a plastic rubbish bin in the corner of our kitchen, and just as I came around the corner, a plastic orange juice container shot out of the rubbish bin and exploded. It left the remnants of what was still inside of it as it sat in the rubbish bin all over. Brown, dripping, rotted orange juice stains scattered everywhere. And I mean everywhere. The walls, floor, tiles, everything was covered in this gross brown liquid. I dismissed it as a coincidence. There was a reasonable explanation for this, right? Something or other about how the juice breaks down and creates gas within the container, causing it to explode. Hadn't I seen something like that on TV once? 
I convinced myself that had to be it. I managed to clean up most of it and decided that I would just wait for my mom to come back home to help me with the rest of it. At the time, my mom laughed about it and remarked about what powerful juice that was, but now I don't laugh about it. This was just the beginning and what came next will haunt me forever. That night I had such horrid nightmares, I can't begin to explain them. I remember lots of mumbled noises and blood, lots of blood, blurred visions of violence and then darkness. This wasn't normal. I barely experience nightmares, and when I do, they are usually something dumb or stupid. That night, I didn't sleep well, at all, but again, I didn't think too much of it. Sunday was when I began packing for the trip. I placed the Ouija board in my suitcase and left the suitcase in front of my bed so that I wouldn't forget it the next day. As I was getting ready for bed, something seemed odd. You know, how you just get that gut feeling sometimes, that something is really wrong? Again, I blew it off thinking it was just anxiety about tomorrow's big trip, but boy was I wrong. The night was cold. I could hear the wind blowing outside my window as I drifted to sleep and slipped into the abyss of my mind. My dreams were again loud and frustrating. Just like the night before, there was blood. This time there were screams. The whole dream was foggy and unidentifiable, but it felt like something was spawning. A corruption. I woke up breathing heavily, as if I had been holding my breath. I was sweating, not just a little bit. No, I was drenched in sweat. I was barely awake and already my skin was crawling as I stared at the ceiling, catching my breath. I closed my eyes and did my best to calm down, knowing that it was over. The nightmare was done. I lifted my head and looked around my room. It was dark and silent, apart from the fan that was always running in my room. I reached for my phone and checked the time. 2.50 a.m., That made my skin crawl again. It was almost 3 a.m., and even though I never believed in the 3 a.m. haunting hour crap, something didn't feel right. The air felt thick, and I felt like someone, something, was watching me. I sat up, and to my horror, there was something there in the dark with me. For a second, I couldn't move. I was trying to understand what I was looking at. I blinked, and there, on top of my big suitcase, sat the figure of a girl. I could see her so perfectly. I could see her hair and her feet. She was staring at me. I barely had time to process this before I realized there was someone else in the room. Right beside her stood an outline of a tall man. He stood very still, but I knew he was there. I reacted by grabbing my blankets and throwing them over my head. I sat there under the bed covers and tried to remain completely still. My heart hurt from just how hard it was beating. Was I having a heart attack? What was this feeling? It was at that moment that I realized I was feeling pure fear the kind of fear I have never felt before in my entire life. This can't be right. I must still be in my nightmare. I began counting my fingers. There were 10. I was awake. My mind raced. I knew whatever that was was not real. I have to be hallucinating or something. But how do I know for sure? I thought of grabbing my phone and using that as a light. But if those beings were real, it would be more terrifying to see their true forms under such dim light. I decided to count to three, and on three, I would run to the door and turn on the lights. One, two, I was stuck on two, my mind hurt, then finally, three. I threw the blankets off my head and jumped out of the bed. As soon as my feet hit the ground, I started to run toward my light switch. I winced at the pain from my feet as the pins and needles shot through my legs. I was fully awake, but my legs were not. As I ran, even though I felt like I was going fast, What I saw will forever be ingrained in my mind. It was the eerie figure of the girl sitting perfectly still on my suitcase, with her head slightly tilted in my direction, and the tall man beside her. He just stared blankly at my bed. I made it to the lights and turned them on. Sure enough, there was nothing there. I felt relieved, but not entirely. Whatever that was, it terrified the crap out of me. I did not sleep that night. I didn't want to wake up to those things that night or ever again. I had the lights on for the rest of the night. I tried to distract myself by doing random things around my room, but something in me told me, destroy that Ouija board. The thought echoed in my mind throughout the night. Eventually, I couldn't take it any longer. I was losing my battle to stay awake. Nothing had happened for a while. It had to be a fluke. I decided to lie down and try to relax. I shut down my phone and lay there in my bed perfectly still. Suddenly, I began to hear the loudest cracking noises. It made me jump. I thought it was my phone since something similar had happened in the past, where my phone's screen began to crack all of a sudden. 
I looked up and grabbed my phone. It was fine. The noise was gone. I looked around the room. I looked at my mirror. It wasn't my mirror. I checked my window. Still nothing. However, when I replayed that sound in my mind, I realized that it sounded more like the sound you often hear in a movie when someone breaks a bone. I wasn't watching in movies. No one was. Everyone in the house was asleep, except me. That freaked me out once again, so I did not move from my bed. My whole body was shaking. I tried to watch TikTok to distract myself. I stayed like that for another hour or so. Then after gaining some kind of bravery, I decided to get back up and try to work out. Maybe that would distract me. The time was 4.30 a.m. As I was getting into comfy clothes, I heard the loudest sound of a train. The sound was so loud it made my head shake. I live in the countryside where there are no trains whatsoever. That pushed me over the edge. I grabbed everything and jumped back into my bed. Although I feel pretty dumb saying this, I began to pray. I prayed hard and wished that all of this would be over. It was nearly 5 a.m. I needed to get up. I wanted to surprise my mom with a gift before going to school. It was her birthday, but I was scared out of my mind and didn't want to be alone. I had to wake up my little sister and use a lie. I told her, I need your help to decorate the living room for mom's birthday. It worked. I felt much better being with someone, even if it was my little sister. It wasn't long before my mom woke up and came downstairs. I sang her the happy birthday song and I gave her her present. As we sat in the living room together, I couldn't hold in my fear. I told my mom what happened. I tried my best to make it sound as lighthearted as I could so that she wouldn't be scared. When I was done telling her what happened, my mom had a horrified look on her face. That further confirmed that I had a reason to be scared. I kind of laughed it off by saying something like, "Uh, I haven't slept since 2.50 a.m. Guess the spirits really did want to talk with me after all. But that didn't make me feel better. My mother suggested getting rid of the board. I was way ahead of her. I got a plastic bag, put the Ouija board and all of its parts inside of it, and told her to throw it away as far as possible from us. I couldn't even bring myself to watch her walk out the door with it. I must say, though, the moment it was out of my room, I felt relief as if a thick air that once made it hard to breathe had been cleared out. I wanted to take a shower before I left, but I got so scared at the thought of being alone in the shower, I broke down. I began crying. My mom hugged me tight and calmed me down. I eventually calmed down, but I ended up not showering. I just sat there cuddling with my mom right up to the moment I needed to leave for my school trip. The trip was fairly uneventful in comparison to the weekend before. My friends were surprised that I didn't bring the Ouija board. I just told them that my parents didn't want me to bring the board and they believed me. The best part? I slept just fine on the trip. No nightmares, no weird happenings, no creepy girls in the middle of the night. I felt fine and no longer felt scared of being alone. It wasn't until I came back home that things changed. When I walked into my room, something felt off again. I couldn't put my finger on it. It was unnerving being in there. I expected to see the Ouija board like some scene from a horror movie where the haunted object just reappears as if by magic, but that never happened. I do have severe PTSD now. I can't sleep in complete darkness, so there's always a light on in my room. I'm so terrified of being in my room alone that my parents had to move my youngest sister into my bedroom to give me peace of mind. Just two days ago, I brought up the Ouija board to my sister and she told me something that made me sick. She said that ever since that day, she would sometimes have strange dreams. They were always the same. She's sitting in an empty room with a giant clock in front of her, and at exactly 2.50 a.m., the tall, shadowy figure of a man and a girl sitting on the ground would suddenly appear and stare at her, as if they were looking directly into her soul.